Good afternoon and welcome to the 2015 Santa Clara Lecture. My name is Mick McCarthy and I serve as Executive Director of the Ignatian Center for Jesuit Education here at Santa Clara. And today's Santa Clara Lecture really is a highlight of our this year's Bannon Institute, a year-long series of events, lectures, discussions, uh, really uh, around the theme of Ignatian leadership. Now, the strange fact of a Jesuit pope gives us unprecedented lens for discussing this theme, Ignatian leadership. And today's speaker can certainly give us the long view. As, as an eminent historian, he has specialized on the religious culture of early modern Europe and has written widely on the history of the Society of Jesus. His best known work, the first Jesuits received multiple awards and was translated into 10 languages. 13 languages. Every week there's a new book comes out, whether an original one or one in new, new language. Uh, more recently he's produced works on the relationship between Jesuits and the arts, Jesuits and the sciences, the Council of Trent, to name only a few uh, topics. In 2008, Harvard University Press published another of our author's most important works entitled What Happened at Vatican II. Two years later came A History of the Popes, and, and last fall he published another volume entitled The Jesuits, A History from Ignatius to Present. Currently a university professor in the theology department at Georgetown University, our speaker has held fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, the American Philosophical Society, the Harvard University Center for Italian Renaissance Studies in Florence, and the American Academy in Rome. It is probably fair to say that uh, our lecturer today is among the most distinguished Jesuit scholars really of our time. And today we have the honor uh, of, of having him give the 2015 Santa Clara Lecture looking at Vatican II with Pope Francis's eyes, leadership and spirituality. So I would ask you all to please welcome our lecturer, Father John O'Malley of the Society of Jesus. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I have an honorary degree from uh, Santa Clara, and I'm very grateful for it and honored to have it, and also have a number of friends here in the Jesuit community and also in the wider Santa Clara community. So it's a real pleasure for me to be here. We finally brought out the sun this afternoon, so that was a big help. Uh, the, uh, my title, as Mick said, looking at Vatican II with Pope Francis' eyes, leadership and spirituality. So the big picture here, the, the big news is Pope Francis, right? I mean, he is a personality. Uh, he's captured the imagination of all kinds of people. I mean, the fact that Fortune magazine had a long article on him last year about his management style, it was very positive about it, it says everything, and the current issue of the New York Review of Books, which is hardly the most uh, Catholic-friendly magazine that there is, on the cover is Pope Francis. And what is he saying? It's an article in there by Eamon Duffy, the eminent, uh, well, Irish, but a British historian who teaches at Cambridge University in the UK. So uh, we remember his uh, eight million people in uh, Manila when he was there and the three million on the beach at Rio when he was there. And the uh, WAG said in Rio, uh, he thought he saw something that he never expected to see in his whole life. One thing was a, a humble Argentinian, and the other was a devout Brazilian. So, at <laughs> 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 any rate, uh, my own experience, and I'm sure it co corresponds with yours, is so often people go up to me and say, Father, I'm not a Catholic, but I love your Pope, and I think he's doing a great job. 
So they love our Pope. I mean, they like him because of his kind of folksy way of speaking. Uh, he's honest, straightforward. But also, he's doing a great job. So people recognize that uh, he's a real leader. And uh, a leader across the board, not just in religion, but sort of a, a social and political leader, too. A person very much concerned with the good of all. He's bold, savvy, honest, transparent, and free. What I'm going to do this afternoon is uh, two parts. One part will be to talk about Vatican II because I see Vatican II as sort of providing the basic program for what he's trying to do. Uh, the second part will be Pope Francis as a leader and in that part, I want to make a connection with the Jesuit tradition, the fact that he's a Jesuit. So leadership, you know, you, it's something that you're, seems to be in you when you're born and uh, honed by your family experience growing up and your experience as an adult. Uh, so I'm not trying to say that uh, his leadership is 100% uh, explained by the fact that he's a Jesuit. But I do want to insist, and I, I'm convinced of this, that uh, the way he's going about it, there, there are co real correlations with Jesuit spirituality. So uh, that's the way this talk will go. The, uh, what about Francis and Vatican II? So part one. What's remarkable about him on one level is that he's the first pope in 50 years not to have participated in the council. For me, looking at him, that's an advantage. I really feel that Pope Paul VI, uh, John Paul II, and Pope Benedict, on some level, were still fighting the battles of the council. Uh, Francis doesn't have that baggage. Uh, he was ordained just as the council was finishing. He, in a sense, he kind of got it in its pure form. Uh, somehow or other, he managed to assimilate it and to, to appropriate it. It's often remarked that, in compared with his predecessor, he refers, he cites, quotes Vatican II rather infrequently. That's true. And I think he does, doesn't do that because it's so much a part of him. Uh, it's, it's the way he is. It's uh, how he sees the church. And I'll try to explain that as I go along. So how to understand Vatican II? Well, it's an extremely, well, let me say one, one other thing about uh, uh, him and Vatican II. The, uh, as uh, Mick McCarthy said, I, in 2008, I published this book on the Second Vatican Council, got a lot of invitations to lecture on it, and uh, was very happy to do that. But when I finish, I think, I'm really talking about something dead in the water. Uh, it's an interesting thing that happened, uh, and, but it's gone. And then, uh, beginning in a 2012, with the anniversaries of the Council, more invitations and the same thing. I don't feel that way today. I don't feel that way at all. Uh, I think the Council, with Pope Francis, is almost as alive as it was in 1965. But at any rate, it's a complex and rich event. I mean, there's no simple formula for understanding it. It's trivialized by referring to now masses in the, in the vernacular. That has little to do with it. So, but how are we going to look at it? And now, at the distance of 50 years, I think we're ready now to change our method because the way we were looking at the council up until this time, by and large, was sort of document by document. The document on the liturgy said this, the document on the church said this, and so forth. That's very valuable, that's basic. Now, we can and should and must, according to me, step back and look at that corpus, the whole corpus, all those documents. Why? Because there's a coherence in the Council, and there are certain themes, certain issues, certain principles that are based 
on the documents, but occur in document after document after document. So we used to talk about the spirit of the council. Well, that's what the spirit of the council is. Certain orientations, certain principles, so certain themes. So I'll just talk about five that I think are crucial and crucial for understanding what Pope Francis is doing. Those are, first of all, collegiality. Secondly, local church. Third, dialogue. Fourth, reconciliation with other religions. And five, servant leader. So what I'll do, I'll talk about each of these and try to indicate how Francis is putting them into practice. So collegiality, what is that? That's the teaching that the bishops have a responsibility for the whole church as well as for their own diocese in union with the Roman pontiff. So it's a principle in the council first enunciated for the relationship between the bishops and the pope. But if you go through the council documents, it's a theme, it's a principle that kind of descends to all levels in the church of bishops with their priests and of priests with their people. So it's a, it's a real shift in the way Catholics tend to look at uh, the way the church is, the way the church operates. So we really basically sort of say, how is the church? How, how is the church, according to Vatican II? How does the church do business, according to Vatican II? Collegiality? It's a participatory church. People of God, we're all in it. We all have a voice. We don't all have the same level of voice, but we all have a voice. How about Francis? Well, one of his first moves was to create that inner circle of eight, now there are nine cardinals from around the world to consult. Uh, that's uh, one level. It's maybe a modest step, but it's a very significant one, a very symbolic one for him. And then there's a whole issue on the event of the Synod, Part 1, Synod on the Family, Part 1, which we just had last October. What's so special about that? It's so different from the synods that preceded it after 1965. What was different about it? A questionnaire that was supposed to be distributed to all the laity. Didn't work all that well, but uh, really a very symbolic gesture. Then in the, uh, in the Senate itself, he exhorts them to speak freely, to honestly, to uh, uh, say their mind. Uh, that's what you do when, when you're collegial. You're not hiding, uh, hiding people's, people don't need to hide their viewpoint. And there was no prepared statement for it. Other, other synods, the bishops have come to Rome, and they found out that under the table, uh, they were going to be told what they had said. Uh, <laughs> okay, so that's one principle, a principle of collegiality. Then the issue of the local church. That's another issue of Vatican II that kind of cuts across the board different ways. Begins with the decree on the liturgy that the local church is to have some say in how the liturgy is done on the local level. It's a big change from what went on before. And the council also very much encouraged the development of Episcopal conferences and so forth. So another principle, very important, Francis himself now, uh, how does he introduce himself on March the 13th? 2013, Bishop of Rome, uh, the local church. And just recently, last week I guess it was, he made a little, another little sort of liturgical change, you might say. The archbishops, you know, get a pallium. It's a little ecclesiastical, little sort of little, almost a stole. Uh, woven from lamb's wool, partly. And until last week, the archbishops came to Rome and were invested by the Pope. Last week, he said, no, I'll bless the, I'll bless the pallium, 
but the bishops will be the archbishops will be invested in their own diocese because it's an affair of the local church. So it's a very symbolic. It's a very simple thing. Can't make a great deal of it, but it says a lot about his mindset. It seems to me. So. Uh, Third principle, dialogue. Uh, this was a word introduced into the council by Pope Paul VI himself. And he wrote an encyclical during the council, uh, and in that which that word occurs again and again and again. And the council took it up. Uh, so much so that it became almost the, can you hear me back there? It became almost the uh, uh, symbol of the council, and almost a caricature of the council. Dialogue this, dialogue that, dialogue the other thing. Uh, so it was open to abuse and so forth. But still, it's a uh, church, a church of dialogue, not monologue, a church of not just speaking, but listening. Uh, and uh, how does Francis take this up? I think in a few weeks or maybe next week, Rabbi Skorka's coming. While he was Archbishop of Buenos Aires, as you know well, he carried on this uh, ongoing dialogue with the chief rabbi of Buenos Aires, Rabbi Abraham Skorka. And they talked about a wide variety of topics, uncensored, and this was later published. It was, the translation was published into English. That is incredible. That is incredible in the history of the Catholic Church. For a bishop or archbishop to sit down for week after week or month after month and have an open, free-flowing discussion with a rabbi, uh, well, put it in minimal terms, it never was done before. Uh, and uh, it's absolutely earth-shaking. Moreover, he uh, uh, describes it as, uh, uh, what is the purpose of dialogue? Well, it's not to, you know, to come to an agreement necessarily, or you know, I'll compromise a little bit if you compromise a little bit. It's not that at all. It's simply to get to understand the other person, to be able to sympathize with the, where that person is coming from. And that's the whole purpose of it. And then that, presumably, in the long run, will uh, uh, have a, a good effect. So, uh, again, he, uh, as I say, it's the listening church and the dialogue church, and Francis is an excellent example of that. The uh, fourth theme, reconciliation with other religions. Of course, reconciliation with other Christian bodies, but especially reconciliation with uh, non-Christian religions, and this was hammered out in the document eventually called Nostra Aetate in our times. And the major, it's, a, it's the shortest document of the council, and it dealt principally with uh, Muslims and Jews. It started out as a document on the Jews. Significant. It had a terrible difficulty getting through the council. So much so that at one point the commission that uh, sponsored it thought they would withdraw it from the council agenda because they were afraid it would get such a low uh, uh, vote. Maybe passed, but just barely passed, and they knew the Pope would not approve it in that, in that case. So uh, what did this do? It's earth-shaking, I think. It gave the church a new mission. It was a mission to be an agent of reconciliation in the world. 
Well, that's the gospel, right? <laughs> but if you look at church history and so forth, the, that's not always been sort of the con concept of the mission of the church. I have to say that uh, uh, Pope John Paul II and then the little lower key, Pope Benedict, uh, really took this seriously and promoted it. But Francis at another level altogether, I, I just go, keep coming back to this interview or this uh, dialogue with Rabbi Skorka, washing the feet of that Muslim woman. Uh, so uh, it's... Uh, uh, really, a, again, another landmark and so close to what he's trying to do, the, the reconciling church. No more crusades against the infidel, right? Then finally, servant leader. Uh, all through the council, this triad occurs. prophet, priest, king. And this triad, traditionally, at least since the 16th century, has been applied to the clergy. Uh, prophet, the one who speaks on God's behalf. Uh, priest, the one who prays for the people. And king, the one who governs. Well, Vatican II takes that triad and applies it to bishops, applies it to priests, and applies it to lay people. Of course, with a slightly different nuance in every, every level here. They do this at different levels in different ways. But the laity also prof, uh, prophet, priest, and king. But what the council does is do a radical redefinition of king, namely servant. Oh, uh, king means servant. Now that's, that's a neat trick, but uh, that's exactly what the council did. And sometimes it goes unobserved, but again, it's, it's a very important and radical move. And this is, uh, uh, it goes back to the gospel, you know, that Jesus washing the feet of his disciples and so forth. Uh, it could not have been more evangelical. And this is now, how is the church? The church as the servant. The church is the one who goes out and helps them. It's always done that, but now we have it on a different level. How about Pope Francis? Well, uh, that's certainly how he looks at his office, his duties. He has a, as you know, a real contempt for uh, princely trappings. Uh, his refusal to live in the apostolic palace was a, a very dramatic gesture, but also very symbolic of, of his gesture. We had at Georgetown, uh, graduated two years ago, a young student who, uh, his name was Luca Gianni, and uh, he had an interesting passport. Uh, his passport was from Vatican City. Uh, his father is General Gianni, who is the head of security in Vatican City. Uh, so I met General Johnny, I hope that he remembers that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Luca was a wonderful young man. At any rate, the story goes that when uh, Pope Francis was about to take possession of his cathedral, the Cathedral John Lateran, it's a procession from uh, St. Peter's over to John Lateran, uh, he went up to uh, General Johnny and said, Can I ride with you? And Johnny supposedly replied, sure, do you want to drive too? No. At <laughs> any rate, these are small gestures, but they mean a lot. And when he was made cardinal, it's a really a wonderful quotation from him that uh, has really touched me deeply. And it's very simple, very short. Uh, he said, uh, every ascent implies a descent. You must go down if you want to serve better. I think that hits him off. So at any rate, how to put all this together, as I say, basically with Vatican II, now we're looking at how the church, the kind of, 
how to do business, how this touches us all. How do we as Christians behave, as Catholics behave, and how do bishops behave, how do priests behave, how does the Pope behave? Uh, so participatory church, listening church, reconciling church, serving church. One of the great heroes of Pope Francis is Pope John the Twenty-Third. Matter of fact, he has supposedly said that had he been elected in uh, 2005, when Pope Benedict was elected, and you know he was the next candidate, the runner-up, had he been elected, he said he would have taken the name John in honor of uh, Il Papa Buono, the good, the good Pope, Pope John. So, how does John? How did John describe? to the council fathers what he hoped the council to do uh, in its deliberations. And he basically said the council was to show the church to be the loving mother of all, benign, patient, full of mercy and goodness. And I think that's what kind of sums all this up. And I think that's what Pope Francis is aiming to. So now let's move to part two. Um, how's he doing as a leader? How, do, how does he act as a leader? Uh, what are the qualities of leadership? And I have three qualities of leadership here that uh, there are many more. As I said when I began, uh, leadership is a kind of a miracle. I mean, it happens to some people, it doesn't happen to others. Uh, but uh, we can analyze it and get some characteristics that maybe, maybe help us understand it. One characteristic of a good leader is the good leader chooses the right people to be around him and to around her and to give advice. I mean, we rec recognize it instinctively with uh, any executive we know, any university president, any president of the United States. Who, is, who does he listen to? Whom does he talk to? Does he talk to the right kind of people? So that's, I think, the, the first quality. And to do that, you have to have a good dose of humility. You have to be able to say, I am not omniscient. Uh, I need help. I don't know. Uh, I have to go to people and ask them to help me. I must say that as a scholar, I have to practice that. I mean, I'm writing something. I, I always getting into areas that I don't really understand, don't really know. I have to call up friends and say, please help me, and so forth. So that's, that's the quality of a leader. And Francis, again, uh, the first thing he does is that G9, or G8, G9, gather those cardinals around him. The synod itself is a way of getting advice, kind of in a public way. And then uh, his... Skorka, just being with Skorka, he has to say, I, I don't know, this is, how, this is where I stand, you know, I'm, I'm listening to you, so forth. So, choose the best people to help you, point one. Point two, a real leader has to have inner freedom. Uh, not look over his or her shoulder uh, to, before making decisions. Uh, need a certain, a great level of self-possession uh, and able and willing to make moves that challenge convention. Uh, not, not be afraid of criticism. Uh, these are all the marks of leader. I must say that, you know, I was often asked when the long pontificate and the long illness of Pope uh, John Paul II Shouldn't the Pope resign? And I said, well, you know, theoretically that looks okay, but I said, my fear would be that with a, with a Pope still living, uh, the new Pope would always be looking over his shoulder, would not want to do anything that might seem to be an implicit criticism of his predecessor still living doesn't bother Francis. <laughs> Once again, my predictions were absolutely wrong. So, uh, 
he's not like that at all. So he's very much, his very manner of speaking, spontaneous, unrehearsed, uh, break the mold. Those, that line that's so often quoted on his trip back from Rio when he was asked on the plane about uh, uh, gay people and so forth. Who am I to judge? Well, you're the Pope. <laughs> that's what popes do. Uh, no, he, 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 he's his own person. He breaks that mold. He's got this sort of inner freedom. Then thirdly, a leader has to have vision and boldness in implementing it. Uh, he's got to be able to move the agenda, move the institution or move the whatever it is along. So uh, what about Francis? He's shown that from the very beginning. Uh, the very way he's tackled this problem of the Vatican Bank. We don't have the solution yet, but uh, we do know that he calls, has called upon the best people he can get around the world uh, and uh, is determined to do something about it, and he has good people to help him do that. The uh, very way of the Synod, again, uh, it's uh, uh, boldly kind of re reimagining what the Synod is and what the Synod can do. Uh, and uh, it's not a know-it-all papacy. So those are three qualities of leaders, leadership, that I think are important. Now I'd like to make a correlation of that with the Jesuit tradition and Jesuit spirituality and the uh, experience that Francis had uh, as uh, a Jesuit. So, the first correlation would be with where am I here? Okay, breaking the mold, humility, choosing the right people. Uh, here we go to the first week of the spiritual exercises, and uh, before that we just go to the history of the Jesuit order. What about Ignatius of Loyola? I think one of the striking characteristics of Ignatius in his leadership of the Society of Jesus was his uh, choosing two people to be his closest collaborators because he knew they complemented his gifts and made up for certain lacks of gifts. So one of these was his executive, brilliant executive secretary, Juan de Polanco. And in Ignatius's writings, when he was general, it's really difficult to sort out where Ignatius begins or ends and where Polanco begins, even a document like the Jesuit Constitutions. Ignatius was able to let this better educated man, and in many ways, in terms of practical issues, more gifted man, uh, guide him and collaborate with him and say, I don't know, I need your help. And the same thing with the, his second great assistant, this man, uh, Geronimo Nadal, whom Ignatius gave a really plenty potentiary powers to, carte blanche, to go out in all Europe, visit the Jesuit houses, and tell them what it meant to be a Jesuit. The result was that uh, by the time Ignatius died, Nadal knew the Society of Jesus better than Ignatius did. Uh, he'd been, he had hands on. And he was also a brilliant man and knew what he was talking about. So again, Ignatius, that's fine. So this is a, a good example of the humility and this ability and this willingness to choose people better, more qualified than oneself. But 
let's move to the spiritual exercises. So, the first week of the exercises is reflection about oneself and about one's previous life. And if you do it correctly, what you see is you've been messing up. <laughs> you've been often chasing down the wrong, wrong paths. You've been, uh, you know, just uh, not have your, have your act together. So what the first week does is make you aware of your weaknesses and of your uh, change, as I say, change, chasing down the wrong paths and so forth. And the result is we need guidance. I need guidance. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm a weak person. I, uh, I can't all, always trust my own judgment. I need that humility. Then there's another, so that's piece of Jesuit spirituality. Another piece that's often not much attention is paid to in 1974-75, the Jesuits held their 32nd General Congregation. It was an extremely important meeting. A General Congregation is the highest authority in the Society of Jesus. And it was held during the generalship of Pedro Arupe. And in one level, it was kind of a referendum on Arupe's leadership. And it got into and the whole issue of uh, faith and justice came up, which is a very divisive issue, and so forth. At any rate, the second decree of that count of that congregation begins. It's about what is a Jesuit, and it begins: What is a Jesuit? A Jesuit is a sinner, redeemed by Christ. Bergoglio, like myself, was at that congregation. I can't help but think that this made an impression on him. I mean, it was, it was one of those decrees that everybody said, yes, 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 this is, this is right, this is Chico. So that's another thing. Then uh, the uh, experience he had at GC 13, and as I say, I was there myself, and this was a very difficult meeting. It went on for three and a half months. And those of you who are faculty members, so just imagine you had a faculty meeting that went on for three and a half months <laughs> five and a half days a week with no, with the agenda being the greater glory of God. So, uh, uh, there was a lot of psychosomatic illness during that congregation. Uh, and, uh, but what was, when I came back uh, to my province to report, uh, I said, they, what was going on, I mean, it, it, let me say this. Those three and a half months were one of the two most difficult periods in my life as a Jesuit. They were also the best my experience as a Jesuit. At any rate, when I came back, I reported the province, and I, what I said was, well, a Jesuit is a Jesuit is a Jesuit. We had all these differences, all this controversy and so forth, what we knew was everybody was trying to speak honestly for what they thought was best for the Society of Jesus and best for the church, best for the world. And what really struck me was how honest and straightforward people were. Well, Bergoglio was at that congregation, and uh, that seems to me, like I think in the back of his head for the, for the synod, he had a Jesuit congregation in mind. And the good thing about the congregation, the 32nd General Congregation, was a lot of debate, a lot of, you know, passion. At the end, we were able to kind of pull it together. And I was asked today uh, by a, a little meeting I had with some people on the faculty here, so where's the Holy Spirit in this whole thing? Well, I really feel that nobody knows where the Holy Spirit is, right? I mean, that's a mystery. That's beyond us. But if the Holy Spirit's anywhere, it's in honesty. He's in honesty. She's in honesty. So this is seems to me uh, really an important uh, sort of experience that Pope Francis had that I think may, has made a lot of difference. So at the end of the uh, Synod too, that address he gave was uh, really interesting. He said, well, we had a lot of disagreements, and she said, uh, that, that doesn't bother me. Uh, this is the way it should be, and uh, 
The, uh, I see, again, a correlation with the spiritual exercises, the rules for discernment of spirits, so that we had consolations and desolations. And that's just a sign that the spirit's at work and that we're talking honestly and we're trying to listen honestly. So, at any rate, uh, correlation number one, humility uh, and Jesuit spirituality. Correlation number two, uh, inner freedom. Well, that's basically what the spiritual exercises are trying to accomplish. So, uh, I think we need to realize that uh, Pope Francis not only has been, it was a Jesuit for many, many years, he was also a master of novices. So he made the spiritual exercises in 30, the full exercises, 30-day retreat twice in his life, and then was master of novices and led other people, led the novices of the Society of Jesus through it. So he knows that well. And he knows that inner freedom, to find out God's will and to be ready and willing and able to do it and leave things behind, to move ahead, uh, to be your own person, uh, that's one of the big fruits of the spiritual exercises. Then finally, the uh, third correlation with the Jesuit tradition. Well, the Jesuit tradition of spirituality, of course, is the Christian tradition, right? So, but it does have certain emphases. And this third one, with the boldness and courage, Again, a key meditation in the spiritual exercises is the uh, meditation on the kingdom of Christ. And it introduces the second week of the exercises, the week that begins to kind of look at the life of Christ, the public life of Christ. And at the end of this uh, meditation, uh, the uh, person making the retreat is to sort of ask, ask, they ask themselves, so, what am I going to do? I mean, so Ignatius says in the exercises, those who want to give greater proof of their love and to distinguish themselves will offer themselves entirely. So it's an utter commitment and uh, a, a boldness, uh, a full press, if you might say. So I think that's a, another correlation with Jesuit spirituality. Now I want to conclude with um, a really an unusual piece about boldness and leadership. I've mentioned already the Jesuit Constitutions, and they were written by St. Ignatius along with, with his secretary, Juan de Polanco. The Constitutions are an extraordinary document. There's nothing like them in the history of any other religious order. Other religious orders had their constitutions but nothing like the, uh, our constitutions, and indeed different from other constitutions. What's so special about them? One thing is their other constitutions of religious orders tend to be a collection of rules and ordinances. St. Therese of Avila's rule be, uh, constitutions begin with something like we get up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the Jesuit constitutions are have a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, they are divided into ten parts, and they, there's a psychological, so they take the Jesuit sort of psychologically from the time he enters until he's, he's a novice, then he's a scholastic, then he's a priest, then he's finally fully professed, and so forth. So there's that, then there's an underlying spirituality there, too. Uh, this kind of correlation between uh, uh, the church and the world, or human culture and sacred culture. So that's there. At any rate, the ninth part of the Constitution, just before the end, the ninth part has to do with the general of the order. And one piece in that section, that part of the Constitution, has the qualities needed in the general. So in one way, it's a, it's a portrait of the ideal general. You can broaden that and say it's also a portrait of the ideal Jesuit. Because the ideal Jesuit should have these qualities. So what are these qualities? Well, it's a list of them. There's a paragraph or two for each one. 
He needs to be a person of prayer. Needs to be a person of solid virtue. Needs to be a person who knows how to combine severity and mildness and a few other things like that. These are wonderful, certainly basic, uh, or the most basic part of, the, of that whole description. But then it goes on to speak about magnanimity, great soul, great soulness, if you will. Uh, and this is unique, again, in any document from a religious order. So that's one thing. The very fact that it's there, the very fact that that is considered a, a characteristic that the general should have. Uh, the second thing that's interesting is that this paragraph, this long paragraph, is, I'm going to read just part of it to you, uh, is not a paraphrase of the New Testament. It's not a paraphrase of the Fathers of the Church. It's not a paraphrase of St. Thomas Aquinas. It's not a paraphrase of any papal document. What is it a paraphrase of? The Roman statesman and orator Cicero, a pagan. So in the Jesuit Constitutions, there's this significant session, section that's a kind of a slight modification of a statement from Cicero in his uh, uh, book, the on, on, du on Duties, Deo Ficius. So I want to read it to you and conclude that way. I find it very inspiring myself, and I think this also helps us understand Pope Francis and his style of leadership and the kind of person he is. I think, he, think, I think this description fits him pretty well. Magnanimity and fortitude of soul are likewise highly necessary for him because he must bear the weakness of many and must initiate great undertakings in the service of God our Lord. He must persevere in them with constancy, without losing courage in the face of contradictions, even though they may come from persons of high rank and power. He must not allow their entreaties or threats make him desist from what reason and the divine service require. He should rise above all eventualities, not allowing himself to be exalted by those that succeed or depressed by those that go badly, being altogether ready to suffer death itself if it is necessary for the good of the society in the service of Jesus Christ, our God and Lord. Thank you. Well, uh, now the ball's in your court. <laughs> so you want to take just a minute and say something to your neighbor. What, what struck you in this talk, if anything? What didn't strike you? Just take a second. Okay, it's all the time you get. Uh, so that was just to help prime the pump. So comments, questions, whatever, uh, please uh, stand and so we can hear you, make sure we can hear you. A microphone, okay, oh, there's a microphone, all right. Yes, right there. Can't see it. There we are, yeah. Should I stand up? You said that there were five keys to understanding Francis, and that uh, the fourth one was reconciliation with other religions, mm -hmm. and you even expanded that into how the church new mission is to be an agent of re reconciliation around the world. Do you think that that also extends to 
say for example, the LGBT. I mean, right now there's a lot of hot, it's a very hot button topic. And because you're saying that their new mission now is to be, you know, a reconciliation, I mean, like to be a medi mediator between these different religions, does that also extend to things like that, like when it comes to sexuality? Uh, very good question. The, um, first of all, the council did not deal with this, so this is beyond the council, right? Uh, but one way I look at the Second Vatican Council, as I say, it's a very complex and rich event, and there's no simple formula that explains it. But reconciliation is one word, one idea, one concept that I think does capture a lot of things. Reconciliation with uh, other cultures, reconciliation with religious pluralism, reconciliation with the uh, new social and economic situations, reconciliation with this whole problem of historical consciousness and so forth. So you can, under that category. So uh, I think myself that uh, this mode of listening and learning extends to, yes, I never get those letters right. What is it, L, G? Yeah, whatever. Uh, so uh, I think it does extend there. I think it extends to all levels. This does not mean, as I try to insist, I mean, this does not mean that you uh, are giving up your principles or, or what you think is the teaching of the church and the Christian tradition, but that you're willing to listen to the other person and find out what's going on. That's on the one hand. On the other hand, I'm a historian. And what I know is a lot of things that are now considered cast in stone and concrete were not always thus, and that this needs to be taken into account. So that's one of the things I feel myself, my own vocation as a historian, church historian is, to say, okay, it was not always thus. Uh, maybe it should, it's changed. Maybe it should have changed, maybe it shouldn't have changed, but it's not always that. So to take a look at this, all this, I mean, this whole sexuality thing is, uh, it's a new game. It's a brand new game. And uh, uh, so the church needs to think about it. <laughs> okay, can I go? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, I want to ask you, I know you're a historian, but I want you to um, make believe you're a physician for a moment. And, um, a and I want to ask you about the, what your prognosis is for Francis's um, pontificate. We have a great deal of, of course, enthusiasm for him and what he has been doing. But given that the relationship with the Curia and the Magisterium and so forth, do you have a sense of, as a historian, what the, given what you know, um, uh, you know, broadly defined, what your prognosis is um, given some of the obstacles in front of them. Okay, good. Because I'm a terrible prognosticator, right? So anything I say, don't believe. I mean, uh, it's I, I, as I said the, uh, in 2005, uh, when John Paul II died, I was often asked, uh, who did I think the, the new pope would be? And I kept saying, well, uh, it's an open field. I mean, nobody knows. I mean, there's only one thing that's certain. It will not be Cardinal Ratzinger. So, uh, so that's how successful I am, prognosticating. Uh, this is a, a real problem. And uh, there is this back and forth. I mean, John the Twenty Third uh, was a pope, and then was, he was kind of forgotten. And what he was trying to do was sort of forgotten. So it's very, very uh, fragile. But. Uh, uh, somewhat depends on how long Francis is Pope. One thing which is an interesting fact is that both years, he's been Pope now two years, each year he's had a consistory and has nominated new cardinals. Uh, that is very unusual to do that that frequently. Uh, and uh, now if the, if, the, if the conclave were held two months from now, he already would have appointed 25% of the voting members. So, uh, I don't want to say he's packing the Cardinal of College. 
but uh, I'll just leave it at that. So that's about the most like. I mean, who knows? I mean, what I know about history is it takes unexpected turn. Whoever thought Pope Francis would be elected? Somebody like Francis. I mean, I certainly didn't think that would, anything like that would happen. So that's about all I can say. Yeah. Um, I'm not getting up. Um, <laughs> I want to talk a little about theology. In the past, um, theologians who ran into a conflict with church teaching were either um, they either got a censure like Beth Johnson or Anthony DeMello or they were silenced like uh, Hans Kung and Charles Curran. In the spirit that you mention of dialogue and reconciliation, how do you think that Francis is going to deal with say, a Catholic theologian who might write a paper or publish a book that someone would have a tiff with? Uh, okay, I'm going to predict again, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, all the evidence we have, it's going to be a different game. Uh, now, he has left in place uh, Cardinal Müller in the uh, Congregation for the Doctor of the Faith. And uh, Müller is a hardliner uh, and makes no bones about it. Uh, and I think that, again, uh, this how to explain this, I think it's because Francis does not want to, he wants to be not just kind of listen to one side of things. So I think he left him anyway. He would just recently been appointed by his predecessor, so I think it would have been a very uh, bad political move. But I think that diff different, different principles are, are at work here. Um, but he... He's made a couple remarks about, uh, well, don't pay too much t attention to the CDF. What's well, easier for him to say uh, than for us on the receiving end? So it's, again, I, he's not so concerned about those issues, for one thing. He's much, I mean, it depends what the issues are, but he's much more concerned about the uh, bigger issues of the church in the world, the churches, how the church does business. Uh, so I don't know. I mean, but I, I, I like to think a brighter day is dawning. In terms of the Synod Part 1 and Part 2, um, while open and frank discussion are clearly uh, evident. The question of how that gets resolved uh, is not so evident. The, the Anglican Communion has been very unsuccessful in preserving communion around some of these same issues. And I, I'm wondering if that experience at the uh, general convocation of the Jesuits offers Francis any guidance in how to hold things together when it doesn't look like people are going to come to an agreement? Yeah, very good question, uh, and a uh, point to the weakness in this whole, uh, you know, free open debate. Uh, one difference between the um, synod and the Jesuit congregations is the Jesuits were uh, had came, came with a sort of a different, whole different background and sense of how to deal with these issues. It's just a new thing for the for the synod, and I think it's dangerous. Uh, I mean, it's it's it's. I'm glad it's happening. I think it's a the way to go. Uh, but it's not a, going to be an easy road. I don't think we should think that. If, what's the outcome of the Synod going to be? I mean, I think there's going to be a lot of disappointment when it's over. I'm, again, I'm in my prognosticating mood tonight. Uh, <laughs> but I suspect that the final report will not say a great deal, uh, sort of new and, uh, you know, start, start, startling and so forth. A lot of people are going to be disappointed at that. That doesn't bother me, because what I think was important here was that now these issues are out there, they can be dealt with uh, as time goes on, and uh, the, uh, uh, the principle of how, of honesty, and 
clear and open debate and so forth has been established. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous game. And uh, so it's, it's, it's a, you make, make a very good point. But um, uh, and, and another thing about, again, the Anglican Communion has this problem too, but it's, it's in spades in Catholicism. I mean, all these different cultures that the church has to reckon with. I mean, uh, in uh, the North Atlantic and uh, even South American world, the polygamy is not, you know, at least in principle, not uh, acceptable, right? Whereas in Africa, it is. Uh, and all the thing about gay and lesbians in the North Atlantic world, even the uh, uh, Latin America and so forth, that's uh, kind of entered a whole new phase. It certainly hasn't in most parts of Africa and so forth. So it's um, holding this thing together. Now that's what the, that's the Pope's job. That's the Pope's job. And the good thing about Catholicism is we do have somebody for whom that, that has that job. The Anglicans don't quite have that. Not going to solve all the problems, but it's a good, good, good issue. Way back. Uh, I was wondering if you could touch upon some things that Francis may have done poorly so far, or maybe some issues that he needs to pay attention to sort of going forward in the future. Oh, you're touching my hero. I mean... <laughs> uh, let me see. That's not in my script. Uh, uh, hmm. Well... Yeah, uh, one thing I, I don't know the ins and outs of it, but uh, that I sort of winced at was his address to the Curia before Christmas. It seemed to me he just kind of listed all these ways that all these sins that uh, people like people in the Curia could commit. And uh, these are these the scold, sort of scolding, actually, I mean, in an in indirect way. And... Uh, my own experience is that that generally does no good. Uh, everybody, I think of my parents when the pastor would get on his high horse and rant and rave about all the, you know, the sin and all this stuff, all the bad things were going on, and people had to straighten up and so forth. My parents would come home and they loved it, and they'd say, "He really told them." <laughs> <laughs> So I think in general with those things, those kind of generic uh, criticism and so forth, yeah, that's really bad, but it's not me. And then also, first of all, politically, it gets out. I don't know what good that does. And uh, the, uh, what about his people? He has to rely on the curia. So uh, whether he likes it or not, that's the, that's the organ that, Organs that, that make the thing run. So that would be one thing I don't think he's done so well. I don't know. Others may disagree with me on that. I'd be happy to hear. I have a question um, uh, related to the last point you made in that uh, there is a Ciceronian paraphrase at the end of the Jesuit Constitutions. And I take it your, your point is not just that there's this wonderful... Um, reflection on what leadership is coming from a secular source, but that a secular source has been used in the formulation of this religious community. Which I, and I take your point that that's really quite significant. And in your own work you talk about that, that as being, uh, that as being a significant element in Jesuit spirituality. Have you seen in the pontificate of Francis the same kind of reliance on, call it secular thinking, or any kind of a, a, analogy like that, that there's an openness to a way of thinking that is that, that extends or stretches the, the normal religious framework within which popes generally speak? Well, this is not quite on the point that you're making, but I think it's related to it. In his, that long uh, interview that he had with uh, Antonio Spadaro, the Jesuit, the uh, long ongoing interview uh, with this editor of the Civiltà Cattolica, the Jesuit uh, journal in Rome. The, uh, and uh, so this was then communicated to the editors of all the uh, 
uh, editors of Jesuit magazines around the world. I mean, in the United States of America magazine, the editor was there or involved in it and so forth. So what struck me about, so it was a kind of free, free floating all over the place interview. And one thing that really struck me was certainly not the main point of the thing by any means, but one thing that really struck me was his cultural breadth. Uh, he knows literature. He taught literature as a Jesuit scholastic. He taught psychology. Uh, uh, he knows music. He knows art. Um, this, and he's not afraid to say this and talk about it. So it's not quite the same the thing you're talking about, but to me it, it's, uh, I don't know, I like to think that there's some kind of integration there with him uh, on, this, on this issue. Uh, so that's about the best I can do on that. Yeah, over there. With respect to defects, going back to that question, some have said that his free willing speech is a kind of defect. Uh, you mentioned earlier that he made that comment uh, with regard to homosexuality about who's to judge. And then when someone asked him, well, does this mean you're going to change? I forget the exact uh, remark. He said, look, I'm a son of the church and didn't go any farther. Well, you've got those two edges. Who's to judge? I'm a son of the church. Is there some reflection you can get out of those two comments? Not at this moment. <laughs> uh, the uh, yeah, again, uh, it's, it's charming, his free-floating style is very charming and refreshing, uh, but again, uh, he's, he's quoted, I mean, and it goes right into the internet and so forth, around the world, instantaneously. So, uh, I, I mean, th those two, putting those two things, I'm the son of the church and uh, who am I to judge? I don't see those as necessarily incompatible. Because again, I think it's he's ready for some kind of process. Uh, so, and he has his theological limitations too. So. Uh, I don't know what to say beyond that. Uh, it's, um, uh, uh, I don't know what, what more to say, really. Edit. Do you have one more question? Okay, one more question. We usually try to the students. I think we have heard from a number of students, have we not? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, it seems to me that when people talk about Pope Francis, there's this, this reverence for him and the way that he is showing us a new way of having mercy and also this hope that, there's, that, that he will somehow answer the longing we have in our souls um, for something, <laughs> something we want from the church. And I, I feel like I see this in things that you know, I'm reading and hearing, and, and in this room, there's this sense of, he said this, could it mean this? <laughs> could, could he be ready and willing to help answer this, this longing? And I'm just wondering, to what degree does a pope do that? Can they, can they listen to the, the spirit of the people and, and the desire for acceptance and change, and change based on that, as opposed to something else? Well, the loving mother of all, benign, patient, full of mercy and goodness, uh, answer all our questions and so forth. He's not going to answer all our questions, nor should he. I mean, but uh, to present the church in a way that does touch our deepest yearnings for uh, love and care from the church, 
that I think that I think a pope can do. I mean, uh, I mean, see, he's he's doing that. I think. Uh, again, the, the danger is to raise all these false expectations. These expectations which will never be met. Uh, uh, there's, I mean, we're every generate every year we we start all over again with ourselves and with other people. So we never. It's a never-ending process. But uh, uh, I. Uh, what do you expect from the church? What is the gospel? I mean, uh, for me, the gospel is simply the, the message that God loves each and every one of us unconditionally. And uh, seems to me he's, he's communicating that. And if, if something, if that or something like that is communicated, that touches us, that gets us, that, that leads us, that helps us. So, that's about all I can say. Let us take a moment to thank Father O'Malley. Now, here comes the good part. <laughs> yes, he's going to sell his books. <laughs> uh, uh, there are books, uh, of the many books that uh, Father O'Malley has published over the years, there are a number of them out outside. And I think the good part is that he is willing to sign them uh, at, uh, right outside. So uh, I, I, I encourage you uh, to pick up one. Uh, the, the one that was most recently published is, is A History of the Jesuits, From Ignatius to the Present. Um, I would also ask you, it's very helpful for us to get your feedback, so either with the evaluations that are, are physically on the desk or uh, in, in a link that you will receive uh, in your inbox, email inbox, that's very helpful for us for you to fill those out. Just two announcements about upcoming Bannon Institutes. Next week, as John mentioned, we will be featuring Rabbi Abraham Skorka. Next Tuesday, February the 10th at 4 o'clock here in this room, Rabbi Skorka will be speaking on interreligious dialogue, building relationships as persons. Uh, the event is currently at capacity, although we will have overflow rooms in the library open downstairs for viewing the event. So you may also watch this uh, via live stream, which you can access on the Ignatian Center's website. So that's number one. Number two, uh, we're quite excited that on Saturday, February the 21st, uh, beginning at 9 o'clock, we're going to have a symposium on Ignatian leadership. We're excited to be able to welcome Representative Zoe Lofgren and Yale University Chaplain Sharon Kugler to campus for the Ignatian Leadership Symposium to share on their experience of leadership as integrating faith, justice, and the intellectual life. Unfortunately, uh, the third person that we had on the docket uh, uh, because of unforeseen personal commitment, Janet Napolitano will not be able to participate. So for those of you who have registered, we'll be reaching out shortly regarding changes. I think Janet has promised us that she will come again, uh, but it will not be on Saturday, February 21st. So uh, the event is now free and open to the public and will be held here in the St. Clair Room. Please RSVP uh, on the website. We have one more thing to do, and that is to thank the speaker one more time.